I was sitting on some particularly comfortable hallway chairs in this very bare waiting room. The only thing that occupied the room besides me was the clearly fake plant. I'd been asked to wait while this particularly clean yet short and stocky man prepared a room for us. After a relatively long wait time, the official, who had the appearance of Barney Rubble, came to lead me to where I was going to be spending the next couple of hours or so. I followed the cartoon double down a long hallway riddled with doors adorned by various officials' names. It was my first time being invited to such a fancy government building with such bland attributes. He opened the door to a rather comfortable-looking room. He had me sit on one of the colder-looking chairs on one side of the table. It looked like a generic interrogation room, minus the one-sided mirror. I planted myself down, completely uninterested in reliving the events that brought me here in the first place. Thank you for joining me, Detective Buchanan. Soon enough, he sat himself down just across from me whilst placing down a recording device. I wasn't one with much of a choice after such an elaborate invitation. He was parked outside the hospital I was discharged from and informed me I needed to be at a certain address at a certain time for debriefing. Enough with the sarcasm, detective. I'd like you to speak clearly and in great detail about every event of your case. From the rumble of a serious tone, I decided that it was probably against my best interests to continue with my attitude. <sighs> to be honest, this was probably one of the wildest cases I was ever on. Granted, I went in with all my digits, then came out missing one with a severe need for a therapist. <sighs> I exhaled, relaxing back into the cold office chair that was provided for me. The man sitting across from me leaned in, ready to listen. Start wherever is the most convenient. Good morning, Jared. I waved to my entirely too blonde partner. Did you lose a bet or something? My son went blonde and got bullied, so I decided to dye my hair too. He laughed. <laughs> Fair enough, I shrugged. So what's on today's agenda? New case. Been a disturbance downtown in the apartments by Main and 59th. Get on it, the short and slightly pudgy chief of our office informed us. <laughs> I call shotgun. I chuckled slightly, tossing my keys to my partner. I nab it, he frowned as he followed me out the door into my car. It didn't take us long before we arrived at the crime scene, and upon arrival, we parked nearby and did our usual greetings to the cops who were posted at the scene. They filled us in on what they knew, and we went on our way inside. When we entered the apartment, it was pretty apparent there was a struggle. No signs of forced entry, however. Whoever came in here was let in, opposed to breaking in. There were small puddles of blood across the living room and partially down the hall. As we moved farther down the hall, the blood increased in volume. The trail led to the bathroom and the source of its embodiment. Across the floor laid a relatively aged man in a pool of his own cooled and clotted crimson life. The majority of his body was still intact, however, there were parts of him that were forcefully removed. Typical sick psychopath work in my eyes. Our victim is 43-year-old Kevin Harper. He is a clearly single man given the conduct of the apartment in addition to the lack of feminine products or a roommate. It was a co-worker that called when he didn't show up for work. He's been dead for approximately 74 hours. Someone tried cleaning him up a bit but stopped midway. A relatively young-looking man informed us before pulling Jared to the side. Jared stepped aside to talk to the medical examiner, better known as Arthur Davis. He had a grim look on his face as he looked back at me. I had a funny feeling I wasn't going to like this case. He wandered over with a half a smile and a lowered voice. So, Artie here informed me that the body parts were not severed by any normal means. He sighed slightly. I hope you're not implying what I think you are. I felt my stomach churn ever so slightly. It also looks like we have pieces unaccounted for. Hank, my friend, he placed a hand on my shoulder. We can talk to the chief about giving this case up. It's a cannibal case, isn't it? I felt the churn worsen and my gut tighten up. He only nodded in response as I held back the urge to wretch. After I composed myself, I looked him right in the eyes. 
I'd rather not be the laughing stock. Besides, the best way to face your fear is by beating it. I shrugged off his hand. Yeah, but fears and vomit-inducing topics are totally different. He laughed. I was always thankful of Jared. He's had my back since I was first transferred over to the precinct. My issues aside, any news on evidence left behind? I veered away from the body to look at some of the broken furniture just outside the bathroom. We have some hair and a strange set of fingerprints, but we don't know anything until we get this to the lab. Artie smiled, waving his hand slightly. Thanks, Artie. My partner interjected before I was able to retort with a smart-ass remark. While we waited for the lab results, my partner and I decided it would be a good idea to look more into Mr. Harper. Jared would go to talk to his co-worker while I made a request in with his friend in the precinct. She did some digging for me, but came up with virtually nothing. He had an ex-wife and a son who moved to the West Coast five years back and had kept a steady office job since the divorce. By the time my partner came back, I really had nothing to help us go anywhere, and he regrettably had the same issue. A few days into the investigation, we heard back from the lab only identifying the victim's prints, hair, and blood. There was one other set of prints, but those were nowhere in our system. Flustered with my draw to nowhere, I decided to hit the bar with Jared and a few other co-workers. I proceeded to drink the case's troubles away with some hearty laughter and strong beer. We enjoyed ourselves for a few hours, before I got a call from Daphne, wondering where I was at. I laughed into the phone and assured her I was on my way. I called a taxi, not too long after, and made my way home. Alcohol is the most commonly used depressant these days, the agent scoffed. Hey, I'm not getting any younger. One or two nights out with the guys is all good in my defense. I try not to make a habit of it. Saw a guy once, drunk himself right into the unemployment line. I crossed my arms. Suppose Daphne wouldn't let you do anything like that now, would she? I felt myself fall into a guilt trip. <sighs> yeah, my daughter acts like a parent half the time. Sounds like she's got a hat on her shoulders. No, onward, Mr. Buchanan. Just when I thought we were opening up to each other, you put that wall right back up. So hurtful, Special Agent, so hurtful. I took a deep breath. It was two weeks into that dead end when I got a call that there was another attack, much like the one from the first scene. I had hopped into my car first thing and went straight over to the hospital. I entered the hospital bumping into a rather pretty fair-skinned nurse on my way to the elevator. She looked tired and worried despite her nice soft glow. Just as I was going to ask her if she was alright, she scurried off, mumbling something about an appointment. I shrugged off the opportunity and stepped into the small metal box. I pressed the fifth floor, and up I went. I entered the hall, seeing a cop stationed outside the room where the victim was staying. I saw a fairly old male. Clearly, he still had some spring in his step, but I couldn't see him keeping up with the cop next to him. His hair was thinned and gray in between his dim brown locks, his skin wrinkled with years of disgust and stress. His body was short, squashed even, but had a good amount of pudge, clearly from his lack of interest in fitness. His bandaged hand twitched slightly as it rested on his bedsheets. Some of the blood still seeped from the bandages, wrapping his arm and from a patch on his face. I stood in front of his bed and watched as his gaze met mine. Good afternoon. Ain't nothing good about this afternoon, he hissed back. <laughs> Poor opener, I chuckled dryly. My name is Hank Buchanan. I'm the detective in charge of finding the person who did this to you. Now's the part where you ask them questions. <laughs> when I get to it. He prodded. So, I was informed that you were assaulted by a rather suspicious party. I opened my notebook readily to take some quick notes. This was the first solid lead I managed to get my hands on in quite some time, so I wasn't going to pass up the opportunity. He was a freak. A freak, I tell you. He stammered violently between breaths. Sir, I need you to calm down, please. I, I need to know what he looked like. He, he had six fingers on each hand. He lifted his hands as he spoke. His skin was mixed with these dark brown and white patches all over it like a cow. He, he was skinny, unnaturally so. 
The man placed his hands back on the bed sheets. Anything else? Eye color, hair, any other markings? His eyes darted up at me, filled with anger I was all too familiar with. His face. Something about his face. Long stitching. It outlined the break between the black skin and the white skin on his face. There was just enough space on his forehead to see that it wasn't a full circle, but more of a smile, if you will. Not an expression as much as an outline. I saw his gaze lower and the feeling of uneasiness rise. I moved on to asking about the place where he was attacked and if anyone else was there and what had happened. He refused to speak to me any further in regards to the man. I, at least, had something to go on. I gave a call to my partner back at the office and informed him to start a local search for blotchy men with six fingers. At first, he laughed at me. Honestly, getting a call like that, I probably would have done the same thing, but after I repeated it a bit more sternly, he stopped laughing. We hung up shortly after so I could pick my daughter up from cheerleading practice. It wasn't until morning the next day when Jared got a chance to sit down with me to inform me that I'd hit yet another dead end. There was only one person ever registered with a sixth finger and he went missing 26 years ago. He had no known relatives and lived in a foster home that burned down just a couple of years after he went missing. All the records for the home were gone. Several bodies were discovered in the building. It was cold arson case with no known survivors. Honestly, at that point, I needed a miracle. A few days after I hit my dead end and decided to call it a night, I'd spent the last 70-something hours of my life trying to come up with a way to track the cannibal with no luck. I figured a good night's sleep and a meal with the kids would be a good little break. I managed to beat them both home to bake some chicken and make some steamed vegetables. It was cute how the two of them looked so surprised to see me. The little one, Abby, came and gave me a hug when she saw me in the kitchen. I couldn't help but laugh. Being in my field and them not having their mother makes family dinners hard sometimes. It wasn't long before we got a chance to sit down and eat together. My eldest, Daph, often asked me about work. She's shown interest in getting into my kind of field, so sometimes I tell her what's going on. She was like my at-home helper. So what are you working on this time? She scooped some of her greens on her fork and ate them. I have an interesting case. It isn't very appropriate for little ears like Abby, so I'm not going to go into detail. I pointed my fork at her. Abigail was in the seventh grade, so I wasn't too comfortable with her learning about the dead bodies that I deal with. Can you censor it or something? I haven't seen you in like forever, she protested, pushing some of the food around on her plate. I gave a deep sigh. Okay. I can censor it a little. There's a bad guy kidnapping people, and then poof, they all disappear forever. There was one guy who we left behind, and the guy managed to explain the culprit to me, but I scratched my head. You hit a dead end. She finished it for me. Daddy, why do people steal other people? Abby asked, taking a good bite of her chicken. If I only knew, kiddo, maybe it would help me stop them. I laughed. Sounds like the guy's done. Daphne shoved another forkful into her mouth. I paused for a moment and looked at her. She stared at me like I didn't catch on. For a second I was confused, but that had me thinking. If he had done such a good job with his other victims, having countless times to practice, why did that one man get away? He didn't look very strong, nor did he have any signs of fighting back. It was as if the man that had been kidnapping and attacking people wanted to get caught. But why? I wouldn't know why, though. People are crazy. Emotions are crazy. My English teacher told me life is unpredictable and people can go from wanting one thing to another on the turn of a dime. She shrugged while picking up her glass of water to have a nice long drink. Maybe he was sorry for what he did, Abby added. I know I would be sorry if I hurt someone. Abby was so cute. If all the criminals in the world acted like her, I think I'd be out of a job. Adorable seventh graders aside, Daphne really had me thinking. After we finished eating dinner, I cleaned the dishes and tucked my girls into bed. Once I was sure that they were asleep, I took out my work stuff and set up in the living room. 
I'd brewed a nice cup of coffee and re-reviewed everything I'd come across thus far. Just about all the victims were near the same age. The most that had ever been left behind from the victims were fingers, toes, ears, basically the small parts. Some were cleanly taken off, others were not so lucky. They were all taken from the same five-block radius, not too far away from the hospital. The only non-surviving victim described a man that had been missing for 26 years. During all that time, there's a possibility that this was not his starting point and that he presumably had some help, most likely from someone that knew how to clean up a mess. Everything beforehand only left a trail and a hint that the victim was even taken. The last victim threw everything off. Not only was he intact for the most part, but he was left at the scene. Unfortunately, unless the victim recovers, some other memory or new lead falls out of the sky, I can't move on to any set of individuals in the hospital. I groaned, leaning back on my couch. The only thing I could really do after this was give Johan Kingston a call and see if he'd be willing to help out anymore. Until then, I packed up my case and went to bed. I decided it'd be a good idea to visit my friend, Dr. Peter Totschlag. Being a forensic psychologist, he may be able to give me a hand. During my lunch, I gave him a call to see if he was free. To my surprise, he was, and he happily agreed to give me a hand on the case. I met with him at his office, after I picked us up some six from the chubby hole joint he fancied. Oh, a case, and you actually brought me food. You must be stuck. He laughed, brushing some of his stray brown hair from his forehead. Drastic times call for drastic measures, Pete. I pulled up a seat and handed him his food. As we ate, I managed to fill him in on everything and show him a few images from the crime scenes. Then I told him about the last scene and the victim. Yeah, that is totally weird. He slurped up the last of his soda. Doesn't sound like the other stuff at all. You wouldn't believe who got me to look this way. I chuckled. Daphne would be a great detective one day. He looked at me and pushed some of the photos around. I've ordered it from Cleanus to Messius. Take a look at each of the scenes. Here, all the way on the left, it's got the tightest job, while the far right shows clearly there was no second person. So there were two at the scene. Yes and no. Some of them show there were both, others only one. You said some pieces were prettier than others, right? I nodded. Those were the ones that have two people physically working. As time went on, it does give off the feeling that they were getting tired of doing it. He picked up the photos of the last scene. It shows that the killer may have been reluctant to let his assistant help. There could have been a concern that arose, or even the killer was just done with her. Her? Yes. No older male killer would be this caring about another man. Due to the type of crimes and the nature of this killer, there would be a female party or a younger female. I lean toward a female because of this idea of a romantic bridge the killer can construct. He clearly shows some level of acknowledgement of her, and as time went on, it kind of looks like he gave a damn. Any suggestions on the line of work? He let out a rough laugh. <laughs> After all this talk of cleanliness, you're really going to ask that? I have an idea where she may work, to be honest. Oh, he leaned back in his chair. Were you leaning toward hospital? Bingo. All the abductions were ten minutes from the hospital. If anyone would have the time to step away and come back from break, it'd be someone from there. It does make sense. I would... St My phone cut him off with a loud ring. Sorry. I picked it up, and to my surprise... It looked like Jared was giving me a call. It's my partner. One moment. I removed myself from the room. He was calling me to let me know that the victim had returned to the station and wanted to speak to me. I quickly rushed inside to pick up my file and gave Pete a farewell and whisked myself back to the station. By the time I got back to the station, Johan was already waiting with my partner. Once he'd spotted me, he stood using a cane properly provided by the hospital. He grabbed a hold of my arm, shaking slightly. I heard her, detective. Heard who? I questioned him, sitting him down in his chair. The woman, he stammered. Mr. Kingston, I'm going to have to ask you to articulate what you're saying. I don't want to play the pronoun game with you. I spoke firmly. When I was in the hospital, I heard a voice. It was a woman's voice. It sounded like the one I heard before I was attacked by that monster. 
and she was in the area you were staying at. Did you get any glimpse of her face? He shook his head. If I could get you somewhere where you could hear her voice, do you think you could point her out? I believe I could. I give a small smile. Jared, get our warrant. It took some time, but we managed to get all the women who worked on the floor where Johan was staying. A couple dozen nurses, a few doctors, and one janitor later, we had our lineup ready to go. Mr. Kingston was more than happy to sit in, though there was a mix of fear and rage on his face. I double-checked with him to make sure he wanted to do this. He only looked at me for a moment and asked when he could begin. We set up each group accordingly, as well as numbered each woman, so we could keep track of everyone he thought was the voice from before. After two or three hours, we managed to bring it down to a line of six women. Jared took care of most of the paperwork, while a few other officers dealt with witness statements and escorting the previous ladies out. Do you want to take a break, Johan? I questioned, leaning toward the glass to examine the line of women. I'll take a break once I point out who it was. He poked back. I gave a small smirk. We went through the routine one last time, and he was able to narrow it down to two women. One was a nurse by the name of Maberlyn Peterson, and the other a janitor named Margaret Coleman. Both women had a very close speech pattern and vocal tone, so I could see why he couldn't quite point out one over the other. I thanked both him and the ladies for their time and sent them on their way so we could begin our investigation on the women. I returned to the office with new information and sifted through all the clues again. Now that there were many to go through. Both women worked at the hospital. While it was likely that the nurse had the medical expertise that didn't necessarily rule out the janitor, I must have gone over the evidence four or five times, and each time I hit the same dead end. I had to get a warrant for the ladies' records. In the meantime, I figured it wouldn't hurt to call them in for an interrogation. I filed for the search warrant and found Jared. Looks like we're going fishing, I said. Catch and release? Jared asked, eyes wide with excitement. He enjoyed interrogating suspects. Catch and release. For now, I replied. All the evidence adds up to these two suspects, but we need something more conclusive. You did remember to let the chief know, right? As far as you know, I told him. Hey, you're the interrogator this time. You have no reason to look a gift horse in the mouth. Jared decided to shut his trap after that. A few hours later... I stood behind the two-way glass, watching Jared play with Margaret. I could see that he went with the we-know-all technique of interrogation. The tactic wasn't doing anything good, though. Either she was really good at playing dumb, or she really didn't know what was going on. I considered going in to interrogate Mabelin, but there were a few problems. For starters, her record was squeaky clean, nothing I could use to intimidate her. That meant we had almost no tactic to use, and going in with a bunch of questions can always be misconstrued by the defenses, coercing a confession, which means the case gets thrown out. I've always been a little hesitant during interrogations. That's why I usually let Jared handle it. In the meantime, though, I did peek in on Mabelin through the glass, and something about her just got to me. She had this peaceful, serene look on her face as if she didn't have a care in the world, which was weird, considering that she was sitting in an interrogation room. Even people who are completely innocent show some level of apprehension. Not one look of nervousness betrayed her features. She was just not right. I mentally scolded myself for letting my biases get in the way. Jared came out of the interrogation room. If we didn't have so much evidence against her, I'd say she was completely innocent, he replied with a puzzled look on his face. I still have to question the nurse, but that's just a formality right now. If I was the janitor, I'd plead insanity. As he walked away perusing the folder, I went to see the chief about the status of those warrants, though I probably should have told him about this whole ordeal sooner. I knew he was going to ream me a new one yet again. As soon as I set foot into the chief's office, I knew my partner had batted me out. We'll talk about your lack of communication skills later, he said, clearly annoyed, but used to me keeping him out of the loop. Yeah, well, speaking of communication, I awkwardly transitioned. Got any word on those warrants? 
Chief shook his head. You know how the judge is about warrants, he replied. If I'd known that you did it behind my back for the 15th time, I would have told you to hold off, do more legwork or something. <sighs> Great, I murmured. Best news on this case yet. As I left the office, I heard Chief yell out, Next time, be sure to keep me in the damn loop. Any investigator, regardless of organization or position, will tell you that busy work is the worst. It's that stuff you do between hitting a brick wall in a case and finding that one clue that ties it all together. That's what I got stuck doing. I grabbed some coffee and went back to my desk. I worked on the board where we laid out all the different clues and tried to tie them together. I went back to my desk and listened to the recordings. I looked back through all the evidence we'd gathered, even the stuff we originally thought was useless to the case, and got more coffee. All the evidence still said Margaret was the perp. But Mabelin's interview and her attitude before the interrogation were so... off. In such an investigation, it's always been my experience that innocent people don't act so nervous or so calm. Only guilty people hit either of those extremes. Fidgeting, losing eye contact, staying completely still, glaring, a stone-faced expression, speech that sounds rehearsed, timelines that fit together too well. Each extreme indicates something different, and you can just guess which extreme fits Mabelin's performance. Worst of all, there were the subtle clues, the micro-expressions, which seemed to show that she had a feeling of serendipity, almost like you'd see in a woman who was covering for someone she loved. Going back to Johan's story, it was clear that this was a two-person team. It made sense, but then again, the evidence was completely against it. It was like a criminologist had gone through the evidence, and Mabelin's record sterilized both. We still had nothing clear enough to hold either of them. At least, I could take my suspicions to the chief and explain to him why I was against what the evidence had to say. First, however, I had to get more authoritative voices on the subject and I knew just who to consult. Harrison was a friend of mine through college. He'd been my criminology professor before the FBI decided to call him up, and I joined the local PD. He worked for the BAU in Quantico, profiling psychos for a living. These days, he's a child psychologist. Hadn't seen him in forever. Between work and family, I had zero time. But this was as good of a time as any. I pulled up to his house, located just five minutes from the police station, with my notes at the ready. It was a beautiful, old, Victorian, must have cost him a fortune, especially in the historic district. I buzzed the intercom at the door and looked at the camera. Come on, Harry, I murmured. So impatient, Harrison's voice spoke over the intercom. You're lucky I'm not busy with a client. The door buzzed. I took that as my cue to walk in. Harrison had an affinity for taxidermy and masks. I knew he wouldn't have any of those decorations in his office, considering his clientele, but I wasn't surprised to see a few tastefully mounted heads in the parlor and several masks lining the hallway going upstairs. Many were colorful and garish, ranging from kabuki masks to a few cheap masks he'd gotten from Mardi Gras vacation, but there were a couple that stood out. These were old wooden mask, which looked like the kind they featured in old movies about voodoo and zombies. Harrison met me at the door to his office. Admiring the decor, he asked with a slight smirk on his face. He seemed to have aged pretty well for a man in his fifties. The gray streaks in his hair made him look distinguished, and he had just a few lightly etched smile lines on his face. I patted him on the shoulder and shook his hand. Particularly those voodoo masks, I replied. Think you have time to help me with a particularly tough case? Harrison's face suddenly hardened. I had hoped we could have conversed in more pleasant circumstances, he said in that passive-aggressive way of his. He had quit the BAU during a case involving the ritual murder and cannibalization of ten young children. That was five years ago, and the look in his eyes still screamed that he'd wished he'd gotten that one profile right. In spite of all the other profiles he'd gotten almost perfect, that one case both ended his career busting the worst criminals in America and took a piece of his soul. Harry, you know I wouldn't bother you with this unless it was important. I tried to reassure him. You're the most experienced person I know when it comes to this sort of case. 
I'd hate it to sound like this is some kind of story or something, but lives are literally on the line. Harrison rolled his eyes at my choice of words. All right, he conceded. Let's have a look. A few minutes later, Harrison and I were both poring over my notes. He shook his head. My professional opinion? He said. I think this Maybelline Peterson is your accomplice. She's smart, dedicated, and shows the signs of sociopathy. So why does she work for somebody else? I asked. I thought psychopaths were... Times have changed, Hank, Harrison replied, cutting me off. Take a look at the newest issue of Psychology Today, and you'll see that there is a technical difference between psychopathy and sociopathy. For one thing, psychopathy is generally believed to be hereditary due to an underdevelopment of Loki in the brain that control emotion and ethical development. Sociopaths are made by a variety of childhood trauma. Furthermore, while psychopaths are meticulous in their actions and detached from the emotional states, sociopaths can form emotional attachments and even go to obsessive extremes. The only thing that doesn't fit is sociopaths are generally disorganized and erratic, while psychopaths are accurate and detail-oriented. So, what are you saying? I asked. Is she a sociopath or not? I believe she's formed an emotional attachment to a sociopath, Harrison deduced, putting down the notes and moving toward the window. She herself is not a sociopath. She's found a way to rationalize her role as the sociopath's accomplice. He may have manipulated her into falling in love with him, which would cause a strong emotional attachment so strong that she might be willing to do whatever it takes to make him happy. Why a, a cannibal, though? I asked. Harrison shrugged his clean-shaven chin. I'm reminded of a case that, believe it or not, was featured on Maury, he said. There were two young boys who were severely abused and neglected by their parents. They'd been forced into a diet of dog food to survive. A couple of years later, the Department of Children and Families took the boys out of the home, but for an entire month, they had to be slowly weaned off the dog food and reconditioned to eat a normal diet. Their systems had become so accustomed to dog food, it was impossible for them to stomach too much of a typical human diet at any one time. It caused them to vomit whatever they ate. Looking back, it seemed like an oddly specific thing to say, but at the time, I thought nothing of it. I did, however, take Harrison's statement back with me. Chief would have a lot to complain about, but it would be worth it. I decided to look in on the interrogation of Maybelline again. This time, I could see that my smooth-talking partner was really laying on the charm. This was another technique in which you make a personal connection to the suspect. Make them like you. Make them trust you. Make them identify with you. And they might just be talked into opening up more. Maybe even relying on you to save them. Which, of course, requires that they tell you the truth about everything. The only problem was, Maybelline was really good at playing dumb. Or maybe she really was that dumb. Then again, how would a nurse with all that medical training be stupid? Chief called me into the office shortly after I returned from taking a glance at Margaret in the interrogation room. Just outside his office, there were two cleanly dressed men. They had the aura of, I'm higher up, so back the fuck off. He sat me down and gave me a rough sigh. Hank, I know you saw the two men outside. He waved his hand in their direction. I've been informed the kidnapping case we have you on will be given to those two. Uh, wait, wait, what? Why now? I'm so close to finding this guy. I protested. He gave another sigh as he picked up his coffee. I'm not doing this because I want to, Hank. They came to me about what you're working on, and I was just picked to let you know. Please leave all your information with them and take the night off. You look like you haven't slept in ages. He took a sip of his coffee. I'll have a new assignment on your desk when you come in tomorrow. Angrily, I stood and left his office. I walked over to my desk and packed everything into a manila folder for the two fantastic parties taking the case I'd been slaving over. Once everything was packed away, I happily handed over my work and left to go find some drive through on the way home. I sat in my car, completely flustered with the case being taken from me. I'd been so close to finally getting to the light at the end of the tunnel, and then BAM! A cave-in. 
I sighed deeply before taking a bite of the burrito that I picked up to suffice as my dinner. I know Abby would get mad, but I stand out a little later to cool off. I had a sick feeling the killer would try to go after someone tonight, so I had to at least listen for anything that could remotely fit the M.O. About mid-burrito, I overheard the radio call out a disturbance call for one of the houses in the neighborhood I was close to. I picked up my walkie and confirmed I'd go check it out since I wasn't too far off. I set my food back in the bag and drove off to the address. Just because my case wasn't taken doesn't mean I wasn't going to give it one more go. It wasn't until I stopped outside I noticed it was the nurse's house. Her car was still in the driveway, running, but all the lights in the front of the house were off. I stopped my car and made my way to the door. I lightly grabbed at the knob to test if it was open or not. Once I confirmed it was unlocked, I slowly opened the door. I made my way into the house, firearm drawn. I stopped dead in my tracks, spotting the fidelago cannibal eating in the dining room. Blood dripped onto the floor from the nurse's freshly mangled body. With a short gag, he stopped what he was doing. His head turned to me, part of her flesh being sucked into his mouth. My gun was drawn and I aimed right at him. To be honest, I was shaking for a moment as I watched him chew. I felt myself become queasy. Right before me was the nurse I'd spoken to not than four hours before, gutted on her own kitchen table. I think you forgot to say freeze, good sir. A quick gulp and he'd emptied his mouth and smiled. You look positively green. Would you like a bucket? His voice was deep and crisply filled with joy to see me. He straightened himself out, patting out the bloodied apron. Pardon my table manners. <laughs> Laughter soon followed as his head and eyes scanned the room. My gun was still pointed at him. I was able to keep myself from throwing up for the second time in the last few minutes. I groaned a bit, changing positions in the chair I was sitting on. The suited man across from me looked displeased with my sudden pauses and verbal complaints regarding my seating arrangement. Honestly, I was just stalling. I don't know if he saw it, but I was particularly uneasy about the next part. A homicide detective with a weak stomach. It's a bit ironic, isn't it? He looked amused for a moment while I frowned. I can handle anything else, but the idea of a person eating another person gets me a little sick, okay? I grumbled in response. Continue, detective. He urged. I am, I am. These chairs aren't very guest-friendly now, are they? I kept moving about my seat. Detective... Okay. Basically, he asked me to listen to his story. I exhaled. He took a seat on a really comfortable cushioned chair and asked if I could listen to his story before I arrested him. And you did that. He spoke in disbelief and partial annoyance. I was stalling for backup, on the verge of throwing up my snack. Now, can I continue? Or are you going to pull up a nice seat and ask more questions? I may or may not have growled at him with a bit of my side comment. What did he say to you? Well? He sat back next to the body. My gun still pointed right at him. I only nodded in response to his question. He threw on an eerie smile, pulling at some of the stitching at the corners of his mouth. I was... Twelve. Somewhere around that age, honestly, with this place. Where I was stuck at, I lost most of what little memories of my childhood I had. I was a foster kid. No mom, no dad, just a bunch of other kids. It's vague, but I do remember a level of acceptance from all of them. He stared at the ground while he pushed himself onto his feet as if he were dazed, lost in his own thoughts. And then I was taken. Your missing person poster is still sitting on my desk. Who took you? No clue. All I know is that his name, or I rather was his name, was Jack. His gaze connected with mine. I took his name shortly after eating him. So, so, you ate the man who kidnapped you. At twelve. Don't misunderstand. I was not twelve when I ate the man that ruined me. Have you ever had anything you know, everyone you see just disappear? 
It makes you lonely. It drives you crazy. Now on top of that, you add on being trapped in a basement with a man named Jack, force-feeding you humans days and days after starvation. What do you think that does to a child? The torture of a man, pinching and clamping the skin on your face until there's nothing but a flap of skin, much like when you become overweight and the rest of you hangs there once it's gone. I remember him taking the scissors out one day. He sharpened them and grabbed at the flap. He started at my forehead and cut his way down the corners from my mouth. There was nothing to numb the pain, but after what he would put me through, I don't think I even remember screaming. I just remember the blood and the stitching he did to make my face whole again. He stretched out this white part here. It's so tight over my nose and eyes. He lightly touched the center of his face and drug his fingers down to touch some of the stitching he had on his top lip. He called me Smiler from that day on. I don't even know why he did it to me, but hey, life's a bitch, isn't it? And her? I moved my head slightly, directing it at the ever-cooling body on the table. Uh, yes, <laughs> the peach. She was rather a nice partner. I met her after trying to move back into society. As you can see, he opened his arms wide as if he were showing himself off to me. I'm not exactly appealing to society these days, so I decided to just go back the way the man made me. A monstrosity. She, however, thought she could reverse what he did to me. I told her it was a terrible idea to let a cannibal in the house. How'd she persuade you not to do what you just did to her, but sooner. She promised me a good meal and a place to stay. Come now, you know, the only way to a man's heart is in his stomach. In my particular case, I go through the chest cavity. <laughs> he laughed a little. To tell you the truth, she reminded me of someone I once knew, but I came to realize I was living a make-believe life. You just conveniently got to me today. I was honestly rather engaged with this story, so much so that I hadn't realized he was getting closer until he had enough range to knock the gun out of my hand. Then we got into a good fight for a moment or two. He bit off my finger, and we both landed on the floor. I lifted my hand, showing him my sudden love for the number nine. After that, I managed to grab my gun and caught him right between the eyes. There was a silence between us, as if he was expecting me to say more. Is that all, Detective? Yes, sir. I nodded, leaning onto the table to give my back a break from the chair. Is there supposed to be anything else? I suppose not, he sighed, leaning forward for the device. Click. The recorder was turned off. He overlapped his fingers between his knuckles and rested them on the table between us. There was an awkward silence left between us before I cleared my throat. So... Agent. Special Agent Jackson. <laughs> so, Agent Jack, why take such an interest in this case anyway? It was just another twisted man gone off his rocker. I lightly patted the table. The man across from me removed the sunglasses, shielding his eyes, and stared at me. Detective Buchanan, I would heavily advise you to forget any of this had ever happened. Huh? It caught me off guard. I'd spent months putting that case together just to get it taken and then told to pretend it didn't happen? You have two daughters at home, correct? Yes, sir, I do. Abigail and Daphne wouldn't want to live their lives without their parents. He replaced the glasses on his face and stood to open the door for me. Have a good afternoon, detective. I gathered myself and made my way out of the room. Back down the hall I went and out the front doors. I took a few steps down the front marble stairs and pulled out a cigarette and a lighter from my jacket pockets. I stared back at the building as I lit it and then went on my merry way. It was at that moment that what Smiler Guy told me about made complete sense. This is the part of my tale that you keep to yourself, Hank. This type of information could endanger you and anyone else you hold dear. Smiler sat right on top of me, lifting the gun, placing it in my good hand and putting the barrel between his eyes. What is it? 
I stammered, the pulsing of my missing finger ringing with pain. I want you to describe me as a terrible and twisted man, throw smiles and taunting. I shed no tears in front of you, and Peach's face must be riddled with fear. They will find out and want to know everything you know about me. Please lie to them with every fiber in your body. I... I was not random. I was not alone. They wore suits. They broke us. And they're making more. <laughs>